Good afternoon. My name is Steve Nash. I'm a historian and professor at East Tennessee State University. I'm also the president of the Mountain History and Culture Group, a support board for the Zebulon B. Vance Birthplace State Historic Site. It is in that capacity that I am going to bring you today what I'm calling historians in quarantine, maybe or maybe not drinking coffee. It is about two o'clock in the afternoon, so we'll see how people are feeling today. I hope that this finds you all well uh, during these unusual times. Uh, this is going to be part of a series of such talks that will help bring uh, new insights into history related to the uh, historic site, the Vance Birthplace Historic Site, uh, help shed new light onto the history of the site and the surrounding events of which it is connected to. Uh, the one that we're going to do today, I'm uh, especially excited about. Uh, I will be joined by historians Judkin Browning and Tim Silver of Appalachian State University. Uh, they are, uh, Judkin Browning is the author or editor of five books, um, and Tim Silver is the author of three books and um, many, many articles. And they are uh, going to talk to us today about their new book, uh, which is called An Environmental History of the American Civil War. This is a book that I have been anxiously looking forward to for quite some time. I have the uh, great pleasure of knowing both of the authors, and I went to graduate school at the University of Georgia with Judkin Browning. So this is a book that I've heard a lot about on car rides to conferences and other events. So I know it's been coming for a while, uh, and I've read it, and it does not disappoint. It is an excellent book. So I'm really pleased to be able to welcome today to our first installment of Historians in Quarantine, maybe drinking coffee, that talk about an environmental history of the Civil War with its authors, Judkin Browning and Timothy Silver. Good afternoon. So this is Steve Nash uh, for the Mountain History and Culture Group, again, a support board for the Zebulon B. Vance Birthplace State Historic Site. Uh, I'm happy to be joined here today by historians Judkin Browning and Timothy Silver, who are the co-authors of a new book called An Environmental History of the Civil War. And they've graciously agreed to join me for a conversation about the book. So uh, Tim and Judkin, welcome. Nice to see you. Good to be here. Good to be, good to be here. But uh, I'd like to go ahead and just ask a couple questions about the book. And I think, you know, one of the first things that our uh, audience might be wondering is what exactly is an environmental history of, a civil, of the Civil War? If you could, what is environmental history? Let Tim take this. Yeah, I'll, I'll take this one. Um, you know, I think a lot of people uh, confuse environmental history with environmentalism. And they think that when they, when they hear environmental history, they think we're uh, just writing about, uh, you know, what happened to the, to the natural world in the Civil War. And that's part of what we do. But environmental history is much broader. When my students ask me what it is, I always tell them it's... Uh, history with the plants and animals left in. And uh, that's, that's a pretty good sort of working definition. And you could throw in uh, plants, animals, and, and the physical environment uh, left in. Because a lot of times we do histories, and particularly histories of the Civil War, that, are, uh, that, that leave out that natural environment. And we rely a lot on uh, looking at uh, human decisions and human actions without looking at the broader context of these things playing out in, in the natural world. So an environmental history really seeks to, to uh, put those actions in a broader context. And uh, in the case of this book, to look at them in the context of things like uh, disease causing microbes, weather, uh, the need for sustenance, uh, animals, uh, death and disability, and also terrain. So we try to build all those things into an account of the Civil War. Excellent. And, and, and what can this approach tell us about the Civil War? I mean, obviously, there's been a ton written over the Civil, about the Civil War. I've written about the Civil War. Judkin's written a lot about the Civil War. What, what can this approach tell us about the Civil War? Well, we, we like to think that it's a, it's a more holistic uh, view of, of the war that uh, it paints a, a much broader picture. And it, it really helps to show, I think, what a, what a struggle 
the Civil War is, if or was, if you bring in the uh, the the, nat the natural environment and uh, sort of use that along with you know the traditional kind of military history. And I, I think it really it really puts the emphasis on uh, the idea that there were things going on uh, other than uh, than battles and generals' decisions and that kind of thing. Things that were often a lot more important to everyday common soldiers. And then, but even in addition to that, I mean, it sort of points out the fact that you know when we study the Civil War traditionally, particularly military histories of the Civil War, as Tim mentioned earlier. It's about the decisions that Robert E. Lee made, or McClellan made, or um, Grant made. And by incorporating the environment into it, you realize that, well, the environment sort of helps shape the decisions that people make. And so um, sometimes environmental factors bring out the worst in a general. Sometimes environmental factors bring out the best of a general. And so it's really humans interacting with the natural um, situation determining the outcome of these campaigns. Yeah, I mean, if I may, I just, I was struck having read the book that, you know, uh, somebody who's often derided, right, to the point, I, I think most people, well, I don't want to overgeneralize, but I know a lot of people I know when they teach the Civil War, like George McClellan does not get treated particularly well uh, with the Peninsula campaign. And you obviously talk about how the weather slowed McClellan in some few ways. And, and then that comes back later, right, when you talk about Grant and Vicksburg when he sort of cuts off and he crosses south of Vicksburg, he was, he was a couple days of torrential rain away from, right, some basically being McClellan, right? So there's this sort of luck factor involved, and McClellan gets rain, slows him down, he doesn't look so good. Grant doesn't get rain, looks like a genius, right? There's a sort of arbitrary uh, luck that goes into it that, you know, it's just, it, it comes across really interestingly. Uh, in the book. And I think there was a sort of an allusion to that with Grant, right? He, he got lucky with the weather um, when he moved on Vicksburg. Well, I mean, yeah, he, he got uh, fortunate with the weather, certainly, unlike McClellan in that regard. But the other thing, too, is that we didn't necessarily set on a mission to uh, rehabilitate McClellan. And we tried to oh, no, no. Sort of point out uh, that what the environment did was it really exacerbated all the sort of negative features of his leadership. Right. Whereas you know, Grant was this, you know, Grant was a different character, right? I mean, Grant right. was much less risk averse. He was much more willing to you know, take a calculated gamble. And even right. the Vicksburg campaign, as you mentioned, I mean, his chief subordinate Sherman was opposed to it. You know, he wrote his wife and said, I think this is the worst, you know, the most foolhardy operation of the war. Right. I was going to say, you, you hit an interesting point, And I think one that, that uh, sort of pre presents a dilemma for environmental historians um, working on on the war, any other topic, and that is that the natural world sort of moves to its own rhythms, and there's a, an, an element of chance and uh, uh, chaos even in 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 that that uh, we don't so often deal with in history. And you know, it rains or it doesn't rain. There's no real human control over that. Yet it becomes an important factor, and uh, I think that's that's something that. Uh, uh, you know, sort of adds a, a new element into any kind of history, especially the Civil War. Fun, right? You do say in the book that the weather was the same for both sides, right? So it's about rehabilitating right. McClellan. You know, Lee was operating and Johnston were operating in the same weather conditions. So, you know, still McClellan at play. But uh, coming back to the Peninsula campaign, I, I, I do feel like I should ask, you know, as uh, working with the Zebulon Vance Birthplace State Historic Site, um, is there something that came up in this research that maybe speaks to uh, Vance's Civil War experience or the regiment he commanded, the 26th North Carolina? Is there something that you can kind of talk about from this research that touches on those topics? Well, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, early in the book, we talk about sort of the disease environment that's created, right? And so uh, Vance and the 26th North Carolina weren't so much a part of the Peninsula campaign early. They show up a little bit later and they participate in the seven days outside of Richmond, most famously the Battle of Malvern Hill. But Vance and the 26 experienced the same sort of problems that plague the men on the Virginia Peninsula. And that is Vance and the 26, uh, once they form in Raleigh, their first duty station is the coast of North Carolina. They're sent to uh, Bogue Banks, which is now modern day Atlantic Beach uh, near Fort Macon. And they set up a campsite there. 
and hundreds of soldiers immediately fall sick with typhoid fever, which is you know, a, a bacterial illness that comes from drinking contaminated water. And so while I don't know if Vance himself personally got sick, his Lieutenant Colonel uh, Henry King Bergwin did, and a whole bunch of the soldiers. And so that's the exact same sort of thing that was plaguing the, uh, the, both the Confederate troops and the Union troops that uh, you know, disembarked at the peninsula in both 1861 and 1862. And as Tim could speak more uh, even than I could, that you know, typhoid fever is, is one, of the, uh, one of the culprits that did away with so many of the uh, Jamestown settlers back in, 16, <laughs> in the early 1600s. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think what the what the war does in, in terms of things like typhoid is that it, it sort of scrambles the existing ecology and, uh, you know, the the uh, bacteria responsible for typhoid been there for a long time, but it had sort of reached a, an equilibrium with the inhabitants as they spread out across the area. But once you bring in, you know, all these uh, new people and cluster them around in a small place, then you're creating just an ideal environment for that to, to crop up again, um, not to mention the sort of general unsanitary practices in the, in the military camps that contributed to it. I was thinking of Vance, too, in the, in, uh, uh, the letters that came to him uh, a little bit later about food and how short, it, you know, the shortage of food supplies, particularly in Western North Carolina. Yeah. Um, He's got a lot of great quotes about that too, about when, once he becomes governor. Uh, right. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking about, yeah. Yeah, and that's, that was something else I was going to ask about is, you know, Western North Carolina and the experience of Western North Carolinians uh, during the course of the war. If there's stuff that came up in the course of this research, Vance related or otherwise with the region, because I, I know I noted a couple spots going through the book where you all mentioned Southern Appalachia. In some cases, I saw Mitchell County come up a couple times. Um, what about Western North Carolina maybe came up in your research? Well, let me, if you don't mind, let me say, I have a, there's a couple of great quotes from Vance that we use in the book, and I just want to go ahead and use them here, and then I'll set Tim up to talk a little bit more about the mountains in North Carolina, because he's done some work on that. Sure. But you know, Vance has this great quote about how basically both armies are plaguing civilians. You know, of course, Union armies are confiscating food, but then Confederate armies are doing the same sort of thing. And at one point, Vance gets fed up with it, and write to the Confederate government. And his quote is, I wrote it down so I'd get it right. If God Almighty had yet in store another plague worse than all the others, which he intended to have let loose on the Egyptians in case Pharaoh still hardened his heart, I am sure it must have been a regiment or so of half-armed, half-disciplined Confederate cavalry. So you know, Vance was sort of revealing his sort of frustration with uh, Confederate troops abusing their own people. And right. then later, that was in 1862, and then in 1863, when people from Western North Carolina are writing to Vance saying, look, the drought last year wiped out most all of our corn. We don't even have enough food to feed the women and children of soldiers here in Western North Carolina. And Lee's army had sent a bunch of cavalry regiments into the Western mountains to try to uh, replenish the food for the cavalry, to feed the cavalry horses. And so Vance writes to the uh, Confederate government uh, to the Secretary of War, James Seddon, and says, you know, please move those cavalry horses. And Seddon basically says no. And so Grant, uh, Vance writes back and says, when the question is narrowed down to women and children on the one hand and a few worthless cavalry horses on the other, I have no difficulty in making a choice. And so, you know, Vance is really sticking up for the people of Western North Carolina. And, and it's one of the reasons why Vance kind of becomes a burr in the saddle of the Confederate government. because He's a very uh, um, North Carolina first kind of governor. This is a way of saying it. But yeah, the Western North Carolina suffered uh, during the war and the environmental uh, factors of it. Tim can speak more to, he did a lot of work on Yancey County. Yeah, yeah, I worked on uh, Yancey and Mitchell County a while back and just, uh, and actually that's, that, that's true. Um, and one of the things that clearly comes out of the letters written to Vance when he was governor is that people in Western North Carolina were facing sort of a double or, or even a, a triple whammy. They had the men, uh, the white men who provided the, the bulk of the labor force. There's some slaves, but uh, not anything like in other places. And uh, the white men had gone off to war, so there goes the male labor. Uh, a second thing that, that uh, entered into it, you get from these letters, is there was also uh, a terrible drought that uh, cut the harvest short. And then on top of that, there were early frosts in, um, 
both 1862 and 1863. And so you've, it, you've kind of got this, this weather and shortage of labor and throw into that what Judkins talking about, you know, the, the uh, soldiers coming in and, and taking what food there is or, you know, being moved out of the county for one reason or another. And um, people, people quite literally were staring starvation in the face. And there's, no, there's no doubt about that. Yeah, I, I noticed that in one of the chapters of the book where you talk about you know, a chapter on animals, right? The significance, and this is, again, I think one of the beauties of this approach in this book is the idea of talking about all this sort of, uh, I, from military capacity, right, we're talking about logistics, right? You're talking about the draft animals, the mules, the horses, the oxen, the things that are pulling everything, you know, transporting everything. And, and the way that you all break down uh, the needs of the horses, the diseases that they dealt with, and sort of the consequences. But one of the things of dealing about the need to keep re-outfitting the army and the cavalry with increasing supplies of horses, right? I can't help but think, you know, for, for an Appalachian farmer, uh, and I know that you all say in the book that it's often the areas immediately around the armies that felt this pull the hardest. But, you know, impressment agents and whatnot coming up into the mountains, if they take your horse... Right, if they take a mule to serve the military, that could be crippling to a lot of small farmers in Western North Carolina. I mean, to lose, to lose a horse, to lose a lose a mule, or lose the oxen. I mean, it's military necessity for sure, but it could be devastating to a small farmer. Absolutely, and that's that's another factor into why the food production decreased. I mean, it wasn't just the weather and the frost and the drought. It was fewer draft animals, fewer men. Uh, you know, less less food sowed, less food harvested. When we started looking into this and like the steps that both armies took to acquire horses, um, you know, it was pretty entertaining. Uh, Confederates especially, and you know, one of the Confederate uh, quartermaster officers basically says, you know, we were acknowledged horse thieves, like we we recognize that, and that was what that's what our role was. And you have different uh, events in the war. The one that kind of stands out in my mind was when General Braxton Bragg is uh, trying to get more horses for his army right before the Chickamauga campaign. So he sends a few units down to Atlanta and they surround the city and then go into the city taking all the horses and people are taking desperate measures to try to hide their horses. <laughs> There's this one case <laughs> where somebody's hiding their prized carriage horse in the upstairs bedroom and uh, but Bragg's men find him and they <laughs> get the horse out of there. Yeah, hard to hide the horse in the upstairs bedroom. <laughs> it's like, yeah. Um, <laughs> Something about environmental history that brings stories like that out uh, just reminds me of uh, reading a book by, uh, I think it's Catherine McNair about taming Manhattan. And she talked mm -hmm. about trying to hide pigs. Uh, yeah. The city of New York was coming through and trying to collect these pigs, right? And people were hiding them under their beds and trying to find all sorts of ways of concealing pigs, right? Right. People get creative with hiding stuff during the Civil War, uh, but hiding your- I certainly try to. Might not be, yeah, <laughs> might not be the and, best. You know, and, and for horses, I mean, the war was terrible for horses, right? I mean, uh, oh, yeah. one out of every six horses in America died during the Civil War. I mean, that's impossible to fathom in some ways. Yeah, yeah, remarkable, remarkable statistics in this book. Um, doing this book, how has each of your perspectives changed about the Civil War? Well, let me let me take that one first as the as the Civil War rookie here. Um, you know, I, I had ne never um, actually hey, this this is terrible for a Southern historian to say, but I had never really thought in detail about the Civil War. Um, it just was not a topic I had I had touched. I knew a little bit about it from teaching, but um, I, I think the thing for me that was just sort of absolutely overwhelming was the scale of the military operations. I mean, I, I still have trouble kind of wrapping my head around that. I believe we were talking about the Peninsula Campaign. I believe when uh, McClellan landed on the peninsula, he had about 40,000 horses, something to that effect. I mean, that, that's, if you think about just the, the sheer volume of animals um, involved in that, and uh, th these, these just unbelievably huge, uh, undertakings, uh, logistics, movement, all of these things are just, uh, you know, are just incredible to me. And that still, that stands out as the thing that, uh, that impressed me the most. I, I will say too, that um, I don't think I was completely aware of just what a, an unbelievable struggle 
the Civil War was and, and what people went through. I have a much better, much, much greater sort of appreciation or understanding of that now than I did have. Right. Yeah, and for me, I mean, you know, Steve, you and I both went to the University of Georgia and we were both lucky enough to teach the Civil War class while we were grad students there. And so I started teaching the Civil War in 2004 and we started researching this book in earnest in 2014. And I've essentially changed every single one of my Civil War lectures as a result of it. And I tell people all the time that I taught the Civil War for a decade, but writing this book, I've learned a hell of a lot about the Civil War because it just makes you ask different questions than uh, had really ever crossed my mind before. So when I taught the Peninsula Campaign before, sure, you talk about it rains, right? And so you basically talk about mud, and that's kind of it. You know, then McClellan's cautious and uh, believes in inflated numbers and moves slowly, and then Lee wins, and it's over. But researching this book, and you realize the role of the disease played into it, and sort of where that comes from. And then, yes, the rain creates mud, but then, you know, uh, it, what does that mean for a soldier trying to march through mud? And sort of how many calories are they burning? And then we started asking questions like, well, how many calories are they eating if they're getting their regular rations? And it just led to all these questions that I never had really uh, considered before. And it really created a a whole new way of looking at the war. And so literally I have rewritten every single lecture uh, that I have from the war years, incorporating some slice of this research in it. I mean, one of the things that I, I was sort of struck by going through the book too is how you will uh, tend to bring sort of modern comparative numbers in to sort of give people perspective in terms of percentages and how much this would mean or what this would mean. Um, you know, everywhere the Army of the Potomac goes, it's the what third largest city in the South, right? That everywhere the Army of the Potomac goes, well, everywhere the Army of the Potomac goes, typically the Army of Northern Virginia is not that far behind. So that's about 200,000 men, right? Mm -hmm. Lost into Southern communities that are not designed to deal with it, right? And oh, absolutely. And I think one of the things yeah. that we'll keep doing is referring to sort of, you know, using the elements of uh, urban history and what, what urban, what an urban thing looks like every time these armies come in, the needs, the demands. I'm thinking, for instance, right now, just off the top of my head, the aftermath of the Battle of Antietam, right? That the armies don't just necessarily receive, but then all the people who live near Sharpsburg are still mm -hmm. dealing with the after effects of the diseases and the dead horses and everything else. That It doesn't just happen. I think that as a Civil War historian, that was the thing that stood out to me. It doesn't just happen and then the armies move on. Right, the aftermath, or in case right. camps and the buildup to this, like the ecological impact that just having these armies parked in the South inflicted in terms of what they needed to eat and the caloric intake and everything else, and then the just the death, uh, the corpses and everything else. I mean, it's it's remarkable. It really is like these roving cities. Um, I think uh, Tim and I both actually enjoyed. Uh maybe enjoyed as a strong word, but researching that aspect of sort of the whole beginning of chapter three, which is what you're talking about, um, mm -hmm. about the army sort of like being a plague of locusts and then the mm -hmm. aftermath of Antietam. And my God, how many times have I taught the Battle of Antietam? And then right. you know, it ends when, when Lee retreats and then Lincoln issues the Emancipation Proclamation. And that's, that's all we say about Antietam. But when he and I were researching this, it was really fascinating to learn and Tim did a lot of that work about the comparison to urban areas that basically Sharpsburg became what something like the ninth largest city in America for right. a while. Yeah, there's more people there than in Chicago at one time. Uh, and, you know, and we, we, refer to these, we refer to these uh, things as kind of instant cities. They're almost pop-up cities. I mean, the troops, mm -hmm. the troops get there. And, of course, the, there's, no, there's no infrastructure there for food, right. for uh, sewage, for... Uh, uh, disposing of animal waste, animal feed. There's just, there's, there's nothing there. So they either bring that with them or they take it from the people who live there and usually leave behind uh, just a, an ecological wasteland almost. That's particularly true at Antietam. We have one quote in there from a guy who said, uh, uh, you know, he couldn't hear a dog bark or a crow call or anything. And he, he says something like, uh, I thought I knew what lonely was but I, you know i didn't know what it was before this right. and uh, so there's just this kind of after these armies leave there's just this kind of stillness that settles in on the land 
and it's it, it's really powerful and adds you know mm -hmm. I, I think quite a new dynamic to talking about uh, the war. That was one of the things that sort of stuck out to me, and it recurs throughout at different times, right? The amount of fodder that the horses needed, uh, it, you know, tons of hay per day, and the amount of waste the animals produced per day. And, 50 pounds of manure a day. Yeah, and, and building up in these places again, like, you know, for people who might be listening to this or watching this on YouTube, right, the idea of how many of you have been to Antietam, right? And you get out there to this day, Antietam is so fortunate, the fact that it hasn't been developed up around the area, around the battlefield. It's so still, it's peaceful, it still strikes you as being very rural. And um, to imagine it in the sort of context of talking about the war, that all of a sudden, you know, hundreds of thousands of people just deposited there with all the sort of ecological impact that they bring. I mean, it's just, it, it's, it's mind bending. Um, because even today, when you go there, it's, it's oddly and eerily peaceful. Uh, yeah. But could you talk about that, the idea of the industrial north and the agrarian south and how that serves as a sort of understanding or a perception of the war? Well, I think uh, the difference is, you know, I sell it you know, in the class really strongly, right? You know, the industrial expansionist, capitalist, greedy north against the peaceful yeah. agrarian bucolic south. Right. Um, no, that's the lost cause adage, right? right. And so, right. yeah, I mean, what comes out of this is almost two out of every three northerner, uh, northern citizen lived on a farm. I mean, 65% of the northern population was rural. And so when you mm -hmm. think of north as being all cities and factories and stuff, you know, they, it's just we, we tend to sort of think of the south as an agrarian place because it was. But then as a result, we sort of shortchanged the real power of the northern agricultural sector as well. And it was really um, quite... Uh, Quite astounding what the North was able to do and what they were able to produce in terms of food. Um, Tim, yeah, I kept I, I kept asking Jack, you know, you know, as a as uh, somebody not well versed in the Civil War, I kept asking him all the way through, why in the world did the South think they had a chance? You know, given given the food production in the North, given the North had more horses. Uh, think about if you think about Antietam, that's farmland. Mm -hmm. that you mentioned it. So, so you know the the north had a much sort of better uh kind of handle just on the basics of daily living and uh you know i found myself wondering why people in the south even even thought they ever had a chance at this well i mean you know one southerner can lick 10 yankees and england <laughs> well, so it, it, yeah i think one of the ideas is well the south is agrarian they produce all this wealth with cotton and this sort of speaks to the environmental component of it the, the sort of impression then is that they were, they just knew better what they were doing. And, and I don't think that that comes across in this book, right? The sort of Southern agriculture comes across as very uh, ecologically precarious and uh, the input that is so crucial, I think you even pointed there, right? The labor input, the, uh, the work of the enslaved is so critical uh, because it is a labor intensive, but, it, but it's, not, it's not efficient. And it's not ecologically necessarily sustainable, whereas the North, sustainable is a loaded word, I get. But, you know, the North seemed to have come to a grudging level of um, sustainability, to use the word that I just said I shouldn't use. But <laughs> if you understand what I'm sort of saying. But there, was still, there was still more surplus population in the North still more man that could expand westward and open and start new farms and you know right. south you know, basically everybody of military age that's white and male in the south winds up in the army in one way or another so right yeah. um but yeah i just want to point out that you're right that we talk about everybody who teaches the civil war talks about the basic stats of the, where the north had the advantage population advantage uh in industrial production advantage uh, railroad advantage and and that's all true but what came out of this and, and what I really sort of learned as we researched it is that, um, you know, in terms of food production, you know, the North produces more food. The South actually imported a surprising amount of their meat from yeah, the North shocking. focused on cotton, right? And then the North does a better job of figuring out how to uh, can and uh, can food and, and ship and distribute food. The North had more horses. The North had more capacity to make horseshoes, which is something that really plagues the South uh, later in the war. 
So it's all these other things, these material advantages that of course probably no one in the South really thought about because they thought, well, the war is gonna be over in three to six months, so we don't need to worry about that stuff. Right. Once the war's not over quickly, right. these Northern advantages really start to um, tell. Okay. And farming, farming is a dicey business wherever it's practiced. I mean, you, mm -hmm. you, you basically have to figure out, you know, how to get your, um, how to get what you want out of the land uh, without taxing the land too much. I mean, so it's always dicey. And, and I think the other, you know, the factor in this is that the South also had uh, um, the problem of having the war fought on their turf. Sure. In some ways, it might have been an advantage early on, but as time went on, um, the fact that the war was fought there, and they, you know, they essentially had to had to put up with invading um, uh, northern soldiers as well as trying to feed their own people. Uh, you know, it just it just led to the collapse um, or near collapse. And the last thing I'd like to point out is, as we mentioned earlier, humans are making decisions along these environmental factors. An awful lot of Southern farmers made the decision to continue planting cotton and continue yes. planting tobacco, yep. even though the federal authority or the Confederate authorities are urging them to plant more food crops. You know, a lot of farmers are thinking short term and thinking, I want the profit potential that comes from cotton and tobacco. And that really comes back to bite the South in the rear end. Yep. Yep. Yeah. I'm not going to belabor the point, but when people do go on and read the book, um, go in and find the statistics about production and cost of flour and inflation and how a lot of these foodstuffs, uh, the cost in the Confederacy starts to go out of control. And then keep in mind, as uh, Judkin just pointed out, that the South, and this surprised me, was importing a large number of, or a large amount of pork from the North uh, prior to the war. And think about the consequences of that. It, it's, it's a really interesting uh, contribution and a way of thinking about the war. So my last question then, to sort of hopefully bring it all full circle is, uh, what is the environmental legacy of the American Civil War? Like what's the, what's the lasting impact of, of that event? Yeah, well, I think, I think you can talk about uh, a lot of things in terms of uh, a disease environment. It, it, the war changed the disease environment in the country. Um, uh, diseases like smallpox and, and measles which had been sort of fixtures of, of uh, urban areas in the north, moved south. And likewise, things like malaria uh, moved north as a result of this into more temperate areas of the north. So there's a kind of a disease sort of dynamic um, going on there. And we know too that uh, people stayed in motion long after the war. And anytime you have people in motion, it reshapes that disease environment. Um, and, and so that was one. Uh, one of the sort of the curious things that we discovered too, and this is this is almost an aside, but uh, weather forecasting seems to have come out of the out of the Civil War in a way because it's it's immediately after the war that we get what evolves into the National Weather Service, and uh, and not surprisingly, it was a Grant who knew about the problems of weather and warfare set that in motion. I mean, you know, the, the piggyback off that weather thing, that was one of the, uh, the, I guess, one of the final eureka moments that Tim and I had when we were researching this, like realized, like, oh, I'll be dang, you know, the National Weather Service, which isn't called the National Weather Service until well into the 20th century, no. but its forerunner was created during the Grant administration. It was like one of the first pieces of legislation, one of the first bills that Grant signed into law. And, you know, it was this interesting thing that like, you know, this, this forecasting model sort of comes out of the Civil War and the recognition that, well, we really need a way to understand when bad weather is coming and, <laughs> and things like that. The other thing that struck me was how um, devastating it was to livestock in the South and mm -hmm. uh, not just horses, which is the, the natural one we think, we think of. And, and it certainly played a role into why the South took so long to recover agriculturally, even though you know, after the war is over, um, the South goes right back to being an agricultural society. They don't switch to industry or anything, but you know, they're growing cotton for the most part, but still they're farming fewer acres and it's a combination of the lack of manpower coming back, white manpower, and a combination of the lack of livestock. I mean, they, right. they have only two thirds as many horses in Southern states in 1870 as they had in 1860. And the hog population, which you know, is a, um, 
any traveler throughout the South before the Civil War uh, wrote about like Southerners ate pork at every meal, uh, pork and cornbread um, at every meal. And Frederick Law Olmsted actually had a lot to say about that. And the 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 hog population in the South was just completely, utterly devastated um, after the war was over. And we did some estimates based on some uh, figures that were available for a few states. And most Southern states were losing 75% to 85% of their hog population by 1865. So, I mean, they had just completely lost that to a combination of union confiscation, uh, consumption during the war, and then you know, devastating hog cholera uh, epidemics that break out and kill off large parts of the hog population. So a lot of these southern states, they never recovered the numbers of hogs or cattle that they had before the war until 20th century when sort of factory hog farms are set up in, um, in the south. And I guess the last thing that comes out of that that I would say the last environmental legacy, at least to, to point out here, is essentially the creation of the national parks that we know of today as a way of, I don't know what the right way of saying it, it's sort of Tim could probably handle this better, a way of sort of escaping the horrors of the Civil War. And, um, yeah, I've, I've, I teach a course on national parks, and I've always thought it's more than coincidental that uh, Yosemite is, is set aside, given to the state of California in 1864, right in the middle of, of some of the worst fighting in, in the war. And um, there's, a, there's an emerging link, I think, that historians have only begun to explore um, that ties the desire to preserve these majestic, allegedly unspoiled landscapes of the West um, as being a kind of a counterpoint to the ravaged, war-torn landscapes of the East mm -hmm. uh, that had been just, you know, torn asunder by war. And uh, if you if you look at um, uh, the sort, of, even just the chronology of this thing. I mean, Yellowstone Grant signs Yellowstone National Park into law, and and there's a real connection there, I think, between the Civil War and and the emerging conservation movement that historians are only just beginning to to kind of connect uh, as a result. So, um, I think the the one of the things we really try to argue is is that the war was a huge sort of environmental event and an important <laughs> environmental. Event. And and one that became just absolutely crucially important to the to the environment the subsequent environmental history of, of the country as a result. And um, so you know we, we hope it's a kind of a different take on the war, <laughs> um, and and maybe a different take on its legacy. Well, it, for my opinion, it definitely is. Um, you know, this is environmental history of the Civil War is a topic that. You know, only in the last, you know, half dozen or so years have people really started uh, looking into. And I think, uh, I think this book, uh, Environmental History of the Civil War, is going to really kind of push that even further. Like, as Judkin said, um, I don't think that there's a lecture that I give that I can't go back now and revise and add in more content to make it a little bit more, more complete, if you will. So... Uh, with that, I'd like to say uh, thank you to my two guests, uh, Junkin Browning and Tim Silver, professors of history from Appalachian State University and authors of the new book, An Environmental History of the Civil War. Uh, this again is Stephen Nash, uh, representing the Mountain History and Culture Group uh, Support Board for the uh, Zebulon B. Vance State Historic Site. Uh, gentlemen, thank you very much for your time today. I, I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you.